Count Blue, my lord, we have reached Pluto. Yes, about time. Hurry, tell the humans that I... that we are approaching. Urge them to prepare a welcoming party worthy of our presence. Tell them that I expect a good treatment, since our gracious emperor has decided to fill their pockets with our money. Yes, my lord, I will convey the message. Anything else you need? No, you may leave now. Despite the apparent behavior, the noble from Celtes is actually in a good mood. This is his first formal diplomatic mission ever since he quickly rose through the ranks of the aristocracy. The emperor has finally realized how smart, intelligent, astute, ambitious, fascinating, passionate, captivating, beautiful, attractive, trustworthy, and last and certainly least how loyal he is. That's what he's sure of, at least. It is exactly because he gained his trust that now he finds himself here, at the fringes of the Orion Arm in a sector of space controlled by what he's convinced is a brutish and savage race. He's been told that they are a species so underdeveloped that they still use solid slugs as their main type of weaponry, that they barely have access to plasma bolts or lasers, and that their culture is all based around personal gains. How utterly barbaric, he keeps thinking. It is clear as day that what happened at the Battle for Turak is nothing but mere rumours and speculations. The space engagement was already won by the time Terran ships arrived in Yervan's orbit. It is just a mere coincidence that the last push that utterly annihilated the Moth's fleet happened shortly after the humans jumped in. Yes, just a lucky twist of fate for the Coalition's newcomers. This is why he can't understand why his magnificent Emperor was so adamant to spend the entirety of next year's naval budget to acquire Terran warships. He tried to uncover the lies and deceives that those filthy animals used to fog his greatness's mind to no avail. The Emperor insisted it was not the humans that tricked or forced him, but that the Admiralty as well as the General Staff advised him to procure Terran vessels to bolster the fleet. But he knows. He knows that they are not to be trusted. Insidious and envious creatures, they are trying to undermine the Coalition's efforts that have prospered for the last hundred years. Now carrying the weight of his newfound responsibilities, this is no longer a simple quest from the Emperor. It is a sacred duty to perform to defend the Coalition. He will shine a light, show everyone how the humans fooled everybody into thinking their ships played a major role in defeating the enemy. Yes, everyone was fooled, everyone except him, of course. He could already see his great return to the Emperor, the glory, the medals, the recognition, the money, the women. Count Blue, we are here. We have docked in Section 4 of Pluto's Meridian Orbital Ring. The humans have prepared a welcome party. Everyone's waiting for you. Almost offended at how his daydream was so rudely interrupted, he harshly replies, Yes, let us go. Let's see what kind of nasty and rotting station awaits us. Too lost in his thoughts to see or hear about the famous orbital cross rings around Pluto, intersecting perpendicularly at the X0 and Y0 coordinates and locked to the dwarf's rotation. Walking down the ramp, he expected a hastily put together amalgamation of iron and sheet metal, maybe some flickering neon lights with artificial gravity provided by centrifugal force. Ancient, outdated and overrated engineering of especially poor construction, in short, something comparable to his expectation of their warships. What he finds instead is a huge open space, so large that their frigate is comparable to a fish in a large aquarium, so large that there are numerous other landing pads flanking the one they are standing on, so large that one could easily fly around without worrying of collisions with walls and ceiling, or other machines for what matters, and this is exactly what is happening above them. Like a highway built inside the vertebral column of the orbital rings, hundreds of transport, cargo and military crafts can be seen going about their day, dozens of meters above their heads, and in an orderly manner as well. On the short walls, opposing each other in this big and impressive rectangular space, there are two openings large enough to let any craft through and assure a constant and regulated stream for each direction, just like a two-way road for land vehicles, only for flying ones. The Count is so lost with what he sees above and around him that he doesn't even notice the impressive array of Terran soldiers standing firmly, saluting him, or the human woman that is patiently waiting just a couple of steps from him. Like what you are seeing? The Keltian startled takes a step back and a moment to regain composure. He clears his throat. Ahem, I am Count Blue. 
I have come here by His Imperial Majesty Will. I am to assess whether or not our money is wasted in your designs. Please lead the way. The human woman takes a long, deep breath. Clearly already irritated by the guest's behavior. Honored to make your acquaintance, I am the military governor of Pluto's special military district, Marquis Martha Scylla of House Comet. The Terran has short, dark black hair with a hint of white. The eye sockets dug deep and tired, the expression caring and understanding, but the attitude dominative and demanding. On her chest, numerous ribbons and decorations certify her long and successful military career. Impressive! To think Terrans would be so civilized to meet our delegation with a noble, let alone a Marquise. This is unexpected. Well then, Marquise, we don't have all day, do we? Arrogantly affirms the ill-mannered diplomat. Yes, of course, please follow me. A car is waiting for us. It will take your excellency to the location where I will have the pleasure to show you what we can offer. The ride is comfortable, too comfortable. It is simply not acceptable that the Terrans have this kind of luxury vehicles, while most of Keltes' nobility doesn't even know such refinement even exists. It is evident that this is not of Earth's origin. He can clearly see the modifications they made to change its look. This is, without a doubt, a Varanian GL560S with barbaric Terran markings. Really, it's not. What he sees during the short trip makes him even more furious. The path that guides the vehicles is so elegant yet futuristic that it's making him envious even looking at it. The ambient lighting is so delicate yet effective that he would get up and rip them off the walls, and the humans are so precise and efficient in their works that he would actually hire them to refurbish his palace. Maybe if he asks the military governor for a good architect, no, what is he thinking? This is all part of their plan to deceive him. He cannot let this guided tour fool him. It's obvious that around the corner the station is decrepit and leaking atmosphere. Just this thought makes him uneasy and reassured at the same time. Here, Count, behind this door, says the woman calmly, pointing at a magnificent four-piece alloy door, clearly of post-space design. No, maybe Neostellar inspired. The intricate and delicate darker shades blending perfectly with size and forms. The small but elegant and purposeful squared window balancing the whole upper section and... and such a wonderful matching between the utilitarian aspects and the purely aesthetic choices. He could go on for hours contemplating the artistic value of the Type 40 McKay 12C multi-purpose, mass-produced, standard service door. But noticing everyone's stare looking down on him, he recollects himself and tries to walk through the door without staring at the impressive reinforced hinges. The extraordinary normal door leads to a large room filled with monitors and screens showing folders, technical readings and walls of data. Opposite from the entrance, the wall is entirely made out of a transparent alloy with similar properties to glass, but with 3D projections and holograms, on the other side of which one can see from an elevated position an entire enclosed hangar. Count Blue, your technicians and inspectors can freely browse the data from the computers in this room. Equipment, performances, technical reads and reports, plus everything in between, can all be found here. If you could come here and take a look. The Keltian arrogantly walks up to the woman, waiting for him next to the glass wall. As he stares down, his eyes widen, his heart starts beating faster, blood pressure and bodily temperature rise. He's almost in disbelief of what he's saying, as if somehow the humans managed to bribe even his sight. In the middle of the hangar, he can see a very large ship, 450m long, hooked by a rotating arm that slowly spins the vessel to allow spectators to see her from every angle. It's not just a massive ship, it's also a gorgeous craft, long and sleek profile, perfect width to length ratio, high enough to look imposing without looking out of proportions, elegant shapes and forms with a fantastic black color palette with a hint of red undertone. There's no way around. This ship must have been made by humans, there is no other design in the galaxy they could have built upon or taken as inspiration. To this is beautiful. This is acceptable. Tell me more. With pleasure. After careful examination and analysis, we have come to the conclusion that this type of vessel is the most suitable for your needs and demands. The original request was directly made by you and requested compared to rival designs for the following characteristics. 
superior firepower, speed, armor, mobility, and acceleration. Also required, ability to carry starcrafts, ability to operate in large formations, ability to operate solo, ability to function as command or flagship, ability to operate on reduced crew, and ability to conduct long deployments without resupplying. I might have been a bit demanding, but understand, these warships must be the best investment for our money. Tries to explain the noble. Completely ignoring him, the military governor looking at her notes continues. The design follows our standard principles. Triple, segmented and reinforced hull. Maximum armoured bulkheads, heavily protected ammo stowages, isolated engineering section, and protected by five layers of composite armour, a fully digitalized command bridge deep inside the hull that allows for efficient coordination or direct control of all the ship's functionalities with the assistance of the most advanced AI we can offer. If required, the combat observation deck on the ship's superstructure can function as a secondary bridge. The Count is almost speechless. As he is about to speak, he's once again ignored. Armament is composed of 20 quadruple medium laser turrets, 10 on the upper structure and the others on the belly of the vessel. The optimized fire arcs allow for all the main guns to engage any targets within a frontal 120 degrees cone. And thanks to the gun's layout, the ship can maintain firing solution with at least 10 turrets to any point in space, even if approaching from an angle. Unless said targets move directly behind the engine's blind spot, the secondary weaponry is composed of 46 light, double-barreled, multi-purpose emplacements distributed along the most probable angles of attack. Standard for the class, a fly-through deck and adjacent hangar bay allows for the maintenance and quick deployment of six starcrafts. Lastly, we mounted 12 pivoting multi-axis 25 inches torpedo tubes, two triple mounts per side. Regarding propulsion, the ship is equipped with 10 Omnifuel multi-vectoring stealth hyperthruster star engines in two clusters of five, one starboard and one port side, supplemented by 15 additional maneuvering thrusters for combat adjustments or docking ease sparse around the ship's surface. Can I just ask? Protection is provided by two double-coating light shield generators with an emergency backup that are easily able to deflect any shot from your listed rivals, Physical protection is provided by three layers of composite armor at surface level, with two additional reinforced decks. Possible concerns such as crew comfort, repairs, supplies, reliability and much more are all taken into account and properly addressed. You will find more information in the instruction book. Is this true? asked the Count to his entourage as they were checking the stats on the screens. They all nodded in unison. So, how many requisites did you manage to fulfill while designing this? I know I've been a bit demanding. All of them. If he was uncertain whether the Terrans were making fun of him earlier, now he's sure. Be honest, Marquise. Those were outrageous demands. How could you have possibly put together a dreadnought with all those features? The woman has a really confused look on her weary face. Dreadnought? I'm sorry, dreadnoughts would be way over your budget. Very offended by the low-key insult, he takes a good minute to formulate the next question. What is that, then? It's as long, if not longer, than our own Prince IV class super battleship, screams out in desperation, almost tearing for his hurt pride. That's a modified Comet class light cruiser. Funny how it holds my own household name, but that's just a coincidence. Oh, a light cruiser. Yes, a very stripped-down Comet class, MK. 24 B-short hull, factory standard, light cruiser. We somehow managed to remain within the request parameters while removing most of the advanced instruments, electronics and even some weaponry. We are quite proud of our achievement. Almost at a loss, the Count murmurs. Why have you taken off all that hardware? Oh, it's easy. Otherwise it would have been too expensive for your budget. Said the human with a genuine smile stretching from cheek to cheek. Oh, I... I understand said resigned the Keltian, surrendering his body to the comforts of a chair. Well, at least they are quite formidable on paper. How many can we acquire? I'm authorized to complete the purchase right now. Well, with your current budget, just this one. What? That is the whole budget we had for the Navy. How come they are so expensive? I understand that this vessel is leagues above what we have, but this is way too much, exclaimed the desperate male, 
jumping off from his seat full of energy once again. Actually, if we sold the ship to you, we would be at a net loss. With what you are paying, you are barely covering material and production costs. The price is this low only because you are a dear ally to us. If you want to spend less with a starting price of 75% of the budget, you can have five Corvettes custom-made just for you. We... we will buy the light cruiser. Here, please sign this. We already made the transaction. Can you deliver it within ten days at Emperor's Might Naval Base? Well, you see, delivery has an extra fee. If you want, you can take it now, but fuel and ammunition are not included in the price. The Count surrenders himself to the mighty chair once again. Would you be interested in our special promotion limited only to our dear coalition allies? For a little upfront fee for three years, we offer a discount on maintenance, resupply and...